Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and welcome to uh, Friday Morning Virtual um, Journal Club. I believe this is our last journal club for 2020 um, and in light of the holidays coming up here. So I want to thank all of you for joining us and also a very special thanks to uh, Lilly Oncology for generously sponsoring um, this uh, program. Uh, this is really a truly international um, journal club this morning with two of our presenters um, uh, logging in from Western Canada and Dr. Dana Hartle, who has been a, mem a part of this uh, program in the past, is um, uh, live from Paris. So it's a pleasure to have all of them be a part of this and uh, really welcome their contributions. So this is um, very quickly, uh, Dr. Janice Pasika is an international leader in endocrine surgery. Um, she is at the Tom Baker Clinic Center uh, where she has been a driving force behind the development of a multidisciplinary clinic for neuroendocrine tumors, um, as well as heading up a multidisciplinary hereditary endocrine clinic. She's responsible for developing the only Canadian American Association of Endocrine Surgery Accredited Fellowship uh, Program. And she has been extremely active in that um, organization where in 2010, she became the first Canadian and only the second woman to serve as the president. Uh, she's served on the Council of International Association of Endocrine Surgeons, um, and in 2016 became the secretary treasurer, uh, which she currently um, holds that position. Um, of note is that in 2007, um, she was um, the Women's Executive Network um, recipient of one of Canada's um, 100 Most Powerful Women. Um, she has recently completed her six-year term as governor of the American College of Surgeons. Having written over 140 peer-reviewed publications, she's also edited three endocrine surgical textbooks and written over 24 book chapters. Um, so I want a, a special thanks uh, to her. Um, and our discussant this morning is Dr. Jeff Harris, who started his career. This is one of um, the second um, uh, individuals who has joined us on Journal Club to have started off in pharmacology and then migrated over to otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. Um, Dr. Harris uh, is both a friend and former fellow um, he trained, uh, spent a year in New York at Mount Sinai um, and then returned to the University of Alberta where he is an academic surgeon and currently professor of surgery and oncology. More recently, Dr. Harris uh, was granted an academic leave um, to complete a master's of health administration at the University of British Columbia, which he is certainly, um, which he is currently undergoing. He holds the position in Edmonton of site section chief of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, as well as co-director of their fellowship program in head and neck oncology and microvascular reconstruction at the University of Alberta. Um, he is the immediate past director of the um, uh, AHS provincial head and neck tumor group um, and has held a number of national um, uh, positions. He has over a hundred peer reviewed uh, publications and has co-authored a textbook on head and neck reconstruction. Um, he's been widely recognized for his expertise in this field. And then finally, um, I want to thank uh, Dana, Dr. Dana Hartle, who is coming to us from Paris. Um, she is internationally renowned for her work um, as a head and neck and thyroid specialist. Uh, she is a full-time head and neck surgeon at Gustave Rossi and um, chief of the thyroid surgery unit. She has extensive expertise in treating um, advanced and recurrent thyroid cancer and is a principal investigator in a clinical trial in thyroid surgery in role, evaluating the role of prophylactic neck dissection. She is widely published and um, highly sought after as a international speaker. So this is uh, truly um, a wonderful forum and I want to thank all three of our participants for um, joining us this morning. And um, I'm going to, with that, pass this over to Dr. Pasika. Okay. 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, really pleased to uh, be part of uh, this initiative. And um, uh, my, there we go. Um, just have to move a few things off my screen. Um, I've been asked to uh, talk about uh, a paper that we recently uh, published on the identification of interoperative risk factors can reduce but not exclude the need for completion thyroidectomy in low risk of papillary thyroid cancer. And uh, um, we're actually very um, uh, excited to be able to present this. Um, uh, Dr. Chanarama and myself are very proud of this uh, uh, work that we did. I think there's nothing more satisfying from a clinical researcher that uh, you have a question you design a, a study and you then get data that you can then actually uh, apply in a practical situation to your patients. And Shamir and I take this data and this has really helped us with our informed consent on patients with low risk papillary thyroid cancer and it is being utilized uh, by many of our colleagues, uh, certainly here in Alberta. I have no relevant financial disclosures. I will disclose that I am an executive uh, a member of the executive board of uh, Tyro, and this is something I'm very excited about to be involved in. I think this is uh, just a wonderful initiative, so stay tuned as more will be forthcoming. I will also disclose that I am a surgeon, and uh, for any of the uh, internists uh, um, on this uh, call, uh, you will recognize that this is very surgically biased, um, in, and I don't, uh, I don't apologize for that. I just uh, disclose it up front. So uh, the background. So traditionally, it was pretty simple for us surgeons. Um, the uh, treatment of choice for a patient with a papillary uh, thyroid cancer under four centimeters in size was a total thyroidectomy. And then they could be stratified afterwards, um, but we just went in and did a total thyroidectomy. And as we all know that in 2015, the uh, ATA came out with their updated guidelines. And that's when they started recognizing there was more data being produced that there really wasn't a survival benefit for low risk papillary thyroid cancers between one and four centimeters of doing a total thyroidectomy uh, as opposed to a lobectomy. And so in their guidelines, they then uh, said that you could do a to total thyroidectomy or a lobectomy in low risk papillary thyroid cancers between one and four centimeters. What was happening at the same time is that we were becoming much more selective with the use of radioactive iodine, recognizing that once again, not all patients needed radioactive iodine and it did not, um, and so it wasn't going to be utilized or started to be selectively utilized in the intermediate and high risk patients only. And that meant that, as many of us know, the, one of the rational reasons for doing a total thyroidectomy is to allow for the use of radioactive iodine. And if it's not going to be used in low risk patients, uh, all of a sudden that need for a total thyroidectomy was changing. And really that brought into um, uh, um, question, a couple of ca challenging questions for us as um, uh, clinicians. And that was, what is the likelihood that if we went in for a low risk patient that we deem low risk preoperatively, that there would be higher risk features that would either be recognized interoperatively, so the surgeon would convert them to a total thyroidectomy, or they would be picked up postoperatively and therefore would require a completion thyroidectomy. And also what was puzzling us, or we were uh, challenged with, what would the best preoperative factors or criteria should we use to minimize the need 
of having uh, surprise findings at the time of surgery or having to do a completion thyroidectomy. And uh, so when the ATA guidelines came out, uh, many uh, centers started to uh, look at what would the completion thyroidectomy rate if we applied the criteria that the ATA had put out as a low risk papillary thyroid cancer, what percentage of our patients in previously operated cohort would require a completion thyroidectomy. And so it started uh, with the San Francisco group and then Hong Kong and then into Pittsburgh and then uh, more recently the North Shore group. And they all looked at the very similar questions retrospectively applying the one to four centimeter low risk papillary thyroid cancers. And they were all coming up with a pretty consistent number, somewhere between 40 and 60% when all is said and done and the final pathology is reviewed, would be then deemed uh, to require a completion thyroidectomy. And a toss of a coin, 40 to 60% really is not acceptable, certainly not in our healthcare system, but uh, uh, probably in healthcare systems across the world and not acceptable to patients that it's a 50-50 chance whether you will require a second operation. And I think what when we when we then had to sit down and look at this uh, at our multidisciplinary tumor group, we said 40 is to 60 is not going to work for us. But what we kept stressing was what was the impact of the surgeon? Because this probably was an overestimate of the need for completion thyroidectomies, because many of these patients would likely have uh, been converted intraoperatively because the surgeon would have found occult positive nodes or evidence of uh, extrathyroidal extension. And really comes to the fact that uh, my firm belief that surgeons are not just technicians. And so we thought we could improve on the existing data and, and answer those questions, mainly because we had a very unique database, and that is our synoptic OR reporting uh, uh, operative report. And this is a database that uh, was to, has been developed and, and tweaked over the last uh, decade and a half, and it's designed to include all of the prognostic indicators and the prognostic features that one needs in making decisions about uh, a patient following a thyroidectomy. And it utilizes the tool of having mandatory fields. So unlike the dictated operative report where a negative finding is not implied, in other words, if you didn't say there was extrathyroidal extension, you would imply that there wasn't, you ha the surgeon has to manually go through these and can't move on in the operative report until they answer questions such as was there a history of radiation exposure, family history, evidence or suspicion of local invasion. They have to uh, 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 tell us how they assess the lymph nodes and uh, was there a change in the preoperative plan. And this is just a couple of screenshots on the Synoptic OR report. Um, and you can see that you know, history of radiation, if you say yes, then you have to explain what it is. Um, family history, is there a planned operation? Was it the same? If not, why? What was the difference? And then when it comes to the actual surgery itself, um, these little asterisks means that this is a mandatory field. So the surgeon then has to say, was there invasion into the strap muscle or not? Was there invasion in the trachea and so on? And so we thought with that, we had a unique opportunity and uh, set about our uh, study with two objectives. One, what was the prevalence of interoperative high-risk features that the surgeon was uh, uh, finding at the time of surgery? And how much would that really reduce um, the need for completion thyroidectomy? And then we also wanted to know and determine what, um, uh, what preoperative selection criteria should we be utilizing locally to minimize the need for completion thyroidectomy. Um, and we hope to be able to answer that through this study. 
It was a, re a retrospective review using this prospectively provincial-wide surgical database, Synoptic. But we also had access to another provincial-wide clinical database that gave us the information as to the preoperative fine needle aspiration, the um, uh, preoperative uh, ultrasound, and the final pathology. And so we utilized this decade between 2008 and to 2017, and we went into our surgical database and pulled all those patients that had papillary thyroid cancer, that had a total thyroidectomy greater than 18 years of age, and had a preoperative fine needle aspiration with, that it was a Bethesda 5 or 6, but they also, also had to have a preoperative ultrasound. We excluded patients that had micropapillary thyroid cancer, those patients that had clinically no positive disease, and those patients with distant metastases. So we then um, had our cohort of patients uh, that, we, that we got, and then we applied the eligibility for lobectomy. So once again, from the fine needle aspiration, it had to be suspicious or proven papillary thyroid cancer. We then looked at their preoperative ultrasound findings. It had to be between one to four centimeters. There could be no evidence or suspicion of extrathyroidal extension or suspicious lymph nodes. And then we would use the synoptic OR report to make sure that we ruled out those patients that had a previous history of radiation and had no family history. Once we then had that cohort, we then applied what were the features that would have had the surgeon convert to a total thyroidectomy at the time of surgery for this low-risk papillary group. And that's where we could use the mandatory fields of extrathyroidal extension, the discovery of positive lymph nodes, and again, mandatory fields about how you utilized uh, frozen section. Then we would look at the, pay, the, co, the, re, the remaining cohort and looked at the post-operative features. These were based on the pathology reports, and we looked to see if there was any evidence of extrathyroidal extension, positive lymph nodes, vascular invasion, positive margins, greater than four centimeters, and any of the patients with the aggressive histology. We used uh, Strata, uh, Strata version 15.1, and it was approved by our uh, Provincial Ethics Committee. So here is uh, our group. So we had initially 1,213 patients. We excluded 254 because they didn't have a preoperative ultrasound. We uh, detected clinically positive uh, lymph nodes or distant metastases. This left us with our initial cohort that could be assessed for lobectomy of 959. 250 of these were then excluded based on the size of the lesion, suspicious of extrathyroidal extension or lymph nodes on ultrasound. We also excluded those that had atypical lesions on the contralateral side, as most of us would still do a total thyroidectomy in that group, and the history of radiation and family history. Then we found that there was 149 patients who intraoperatively would have been converted to a total thyroidectomy because of positive lymph nodes or a suspicion for local invasion. And we then looked postoperatively and found another 209 patients would have been deemed um, at intermediate high risk because their pathology demonstrated extrathyroidal extension positive lymph nodes greater than four centimeters, aggressive surgical type or vascular invasion. And um, so out of this 709 patients that were deemed eligible, what we found was that 21% would have been converted interoperatively, 30% would have required a completion thyroidectomy, and uh, almost 50% would have been adequately treated with an initial lobectomy. So let's look in a little more detail at the intraoperative conversion. So that was 149 patients or 21%. 
104 of these patients, it was because the surgeon felt there was evidence of invasion um, into the uh, strap muscles or trachea, mostly the strap muscles. And as most surgeons know that after a fine needle aspiration, they can sometimes have the strap muscle tethered on the uh, the thyroid and the tumor, and not all the time do we uh, find that it truly is um, a tumor invasion, but at the time of surgery, it certainly looks like that. Um, so what we did is we, at the, in these 104 patients, we saw how much it correlated with the final pathology, and it was pretty robust that it was almost 60% of the time the surgeon was right, and there was actual microscopic or macroscopic invasion. 45 of the patients, that was the discovery of occult positive lymph nodes, and this correlated well with the final pathology. What about the post-operative risk factors that are um, found? Uh, again, 30% um, needed um, a completion thyroidectomy at 209 patients, and you can see that uh, in the majority of them, 69%, it was just one risk factor. And uh, 93 of these patients, it was positive lymph nodes alone. And we'll look at that in a little more detail. But then there was 25 patients with extrathyroidal extension. Some of the patients, despite their preoperative ultrasound, their tumor was greater than four centimeters, vascular invasion, or had aggressive histology. And then 23%, they had at least two risk factors, so vascular invasion, positive nodes, extrathyroidal extension, positive nodes, et cetera. So let's look a little bit more at the positive lymph nodes because our, our criteria was any positive lymph nodes, and as we all know, that is changing. So we had 187 patients that had occult positive lymph nodes because these were not demonstrated on their preoperative ultrasound. Of these patients, 21% would have been converted interoperatively. So the surgeon found the node, proved it, and that would have converted them to a total thyroidectomy and a, an appropriate node dissection. That left us with 79% uh, of the patients, it was, the occult nodes were picked up on final pathology. Of those, 55 of them actually had a second high risk factor. So they would have been um, needed to have completion thyroidectomy. But 93 or half of these, it was the positive lymph node only that we deemed putting them into the uh, completion thyroidectomy uh, group. Now, as we know, things have been changing. Uh, so when we started the study and we laid out those principles, but the definition of a low-risk papillary thyroid cancer after the ATA publication then started to evolve and change a bit. And it wasn't just clinically and not disease. One could have pathologically proven micrometastases as long as there were, there were less than five micrometastases that were positive still put the patient into low risk, still made the patient not deemed ne uh, having the necessity of radioactive iodine, ergo a completion thyroidectomy. Now for the surgeons, we all know that in order to get a robust enough uh, nodal dissection of at least five or more lymph nodes, you pretty well have to do an, at least an ipsilateral central lymph node compartment dissection to be able to have five lymph nodes that are captured. And so again, we were fortunate um, in our cohort that during that period of time, we went through the phase of doing prophylactic central lymph node dissections. Um, and as you know, that then the pendulum went to, everybody got a prophylactic central lymph node dissection and now it's, we're being much more selective of it. But it allowed us to then do a sub-analysis of our entire cohort of the 709 patients that were deemed eligible for a lobectomy we were able to then look at 400 patients that had undergone a prophylactic central lymph node dissection. Again, this is a mandatory field of identifying it as a prophylactic central lymph node dissection. So of these 400, 
Uh, we had 176 patients in which the lymph nodes were positive, or about 44%, and that makes sense because that's what we see with prophylactic node dissections. It's going to be about 40 to 50%. Of this group, almost, just over half had a second high-risk feature, vascular invasion, extrathyroidal extension, whatever. So they would have gone on to, to be deemed to have a completion thyroidectomy. But 49% or 86 patients, the lymph nodes was the only thing that was positive. And in this group where we had a robust enough lymph node dissection to know that we were getting five or more lymph nodes, only 12, 14%, did they meet that criteria of an intermediate risk category of greater than five positive lymph nodes going on to a completion thyroidectomy. So that meant that 42% of the patients with our positive lymph nodes could undergo surveillance and a lobectomy alone. But it does mean that 26% of all the patients that ended up with a prophylactic central lymph node dissection would have needed, um, would have fallen into the criteria of being intermediate to high risk. Well, what about our other objective in looking at what are the preoperative criteria that we should use to then decide um, which patients are truly low risk? And when we sat down with our tumor, multidisciplinary tumor board, none of us were really comfortable with the 3.9 centimeter lesion in the elderly patient. And in, so in Calgary, we then sort of said, well, would we be comfortable with lesions under three centimeters, those uh, younger patients at 50? And so we developed our own sort of criteria initially um, in which we were looking at the younger patients. And what that meant, less patients, so only 25% of our whole cohort would have been eligible based on this criteria. But the most interesting thing to us was the conversion rate remained around 20%, regardless of how you played with these numbers, smaller lesions, older patients. And the completion thyroidectomy rate also remained up in the 30%. So changing these criteria, maybe decrease the number that were eligible, but conversion and completion remained the same. There were some other interesting results that the mean pathology was, uh, was 1.87, uh, which is slightly lower than uh, what we had on our ultrasound, which we all know does happen uh, with uh, permanent fixation. 90 patients then ended up having a lesion that would be deemed a micropapillary. Um, so they would have uh, been able to have a lobectomy, but 23% had another high-risk feature. And eight patients ultimately had benign pathology uh, in the end, despite having fine needle aspirations that were Bethesda 5 and 6. Now, there are several limitations to this study, and the first of uh, it being a retrospective analysis we, and all of the issues that we know um, are developed because of that type of analysis. The other major limitation is that the pathology reporting in our province, in our cities, changed and evolved during this whole study period. Initially, we weren't getting the details that we now demand of our pathologists about the size, the number of the uh, lymph nodes, whether there's extra nodal extension, um, and the degree of extra thyroidal extension, whether it's microscopic or gross. And so we were dealing with a cadre across a province of different types of pathology reporting. The other limitation is the definition of our high-risk features um, really are dynamic and the degree of extrathyroidal extension, the degree of lymph nodes are, were changing and continue to change. And so I really do believe that um, our raw data here probably is overestimating the true need for completion thyroidectomy. And finally, because it was retrospective and using databases, it did not take into account for the patient's preference or other issues that would have negated a lobectomy at the initial operation. Again, probably overestimating the number that require a second operation. 
And this is just to remind us that we looked at all, any form of extrathyroidal extension, any positive lymph nodes, any type of vascular invasion to put them into the category of completion thyroidectomy. And we now look at those a little bit more closely when we risk stratify. But I would say there is some strengths in this study and why it then added to the literature and that it really is based on the uniqueness of our synoptic OR database. This is entered by the surgeons at the time of the operation and the mandatory fields really were able to, uh, for us to provide what is the intraoperative assessment, how much uh, the role the surgeon plays in making the decisions for the patient uh, intraoperatively. I also think it, the strength is that this is from a diverse surgical series. So this is across the province of Alberta. So these are both high risk uh, thyroid surgeons at academic centers to community uh, surgeons doing thyroidectomies. So it really was a reflection of what is happening in our province um, and kind of real world look. So in summary, um, the wait, we were, able to look at what was the prevalence of high risk operative feature, intraoperative features, and how much did the surgeon reduce the impact or need for completion thyroidectomy? And that was 21%. And we, when we looked, to, could we determine whether varying the preoperative selection criteria for lobectomy could reduce the need of completion thyroidectomy? The short answer is no, we couldn't. Um, the completion thyroidectomy rates, at least in our series, was 30%. But as I said, I think that's an overestimate, and it's somewhere in the 20% range, because the high-risk features are a pathological uh, assessment of the tumor itself. So in conclusion, despite careful preoperative assessment of low-risk papillary thyroid cancers, these patients need to be informed that 21% chance of intraoperative conversion to a total thyroidectomy at the time of surgery. And that really has impacted how we do surgical consent with the patients. You really, as surgeons, need to talk to them that there's a one in five chance you will need a total thyroidectomy because of what you find intraoperatively. And as we know, the risk, uh, that the risks that you have to go through on a total thyroidectomy are slightly different from those of a lobectomy. And that we, we concluded that up to 30%, but I said that's probably overestimating it, would still require a completion thyroidectomy uh, even when all is said and done because of the high risk features. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed the um, red and green uh, slides. I changed them just for the holiday season. I wish to hope everybody a safe, peaceful holiday in these surreal times. And I will stop there and turn it over to my discussant, uh, Dr. Jeff Harris. Thank you. Good morning and uh, thanks for that great talk. Uh, thanks to the Thank Foundation, Dr. Erkin, for the invitation to be an expert discussant here. So as mentioned, I'm Jeff Harris. Um, let's pass, oh, here we go. I have no disclosures. When I got the invitation to do this, it was described as an expert discussant role, which um, that's a new title. Uh, so I look for some guidance as to uh, what to do with this. And the nice thing is it's relatively uh, open in terms of the presentation. So I thought I'd do two things. One is this is a journal club. So I thought I'd do what we do in all our journal clubs and in our academic centers, which is do a bit of a critical analysis of the paper that was just presented. The unique thing here, which I think is wonderful, is that as opposed to when we do this in a in a boardroom in the hospital. Uh, we actually have the senior author of the paper that we're discussing here to, to comment as well, so that's great. Uh, and then I thought I'd just um, go on to maybe prompt and maybe be a little provocative in terms of developing a discussion and talk about what is really what I feel is the core feature of this paper, which is this uh, sort of change in practice from going uh, to from total thyroidectomy to offering lobectomy for certain patients for thyroid cancer. So here's the paper we just discussed. Uh, for me, and sorry, I have to just move a little bit of stuff over my screen here. Um, this really was the key line that um, Dr. Pisica just went through as well uh, in terms of the summary. So for low-risk 
uh, papillothyroid cancer patients deemed eligible for lobectomy, they should be informed of the time of consent that despite diligent preoperative intraoperative assessment, there's a risk of requiring chemotherapy that may be as high as 30%. In addition, surgeons, endocrinologists, and patients should be aware that in 20% of patients deemed eligible for lobectomy, preoperatively and intraoperative, a high risk factor will be identified resulting in conversion to total thyroidectomy if deemed safe. So just, um, again, doing sort of standard journal club stuff, going through the section by section. Study design, uh, I describe this as a what-if study. I think it was a really interesting study design. So basically the, the model was, what if we assessed and treated a historical cohort of patients who all actually in their real treatment underwent a total thyroidectomy uh, and fairly strictly applied ATA guidelines to that population, what would that look like? Um, in terms of patient selection, so all patients had a total thyroidectomy done. Uh, patients were identified in the database, include some, but not, not all the surgeons in the province. And as mentioned, which I think is, I agree is a strength, is that this is a highly variable group of surgeons in terms of training experience and treatment philosophy for these cancers. Uh, the one question that brings up though is patient selection. Um, so all patients as their real treatment had a total thyroidectomy. Does that potentially add to a selection bias for the paper in terms of the, the patients that um, were put through this theoretical model. Uh, there were certainly surgeons around that time, and especially 2015 and 17, who would offer uh, hemithyroidectomy or lobectomy for lower thyroid cancers. Um, and those patients were included in the study. So there's this potential, I'm not saying it's for sure, but a potential that it might skew the data towards this particular patient population actually needing a total thyroidectomy as their treatment. Um, and that always brings up generalizability questions. So uh, if you look at this, um, there was, uh, you know, 50% required a completion. Uh, this study from um, the Mo uh, Sloan Kettering group uh, showed, and this is one of the supporting papers to the American Thyroid Association guidelines, showed that in their study actually 5% um, uh, of patients treated with lobectomy had immediate completion thyroidectomy, and their immediate was sometime in the in the near post uh, operative time uh, based on results of surgical pathology. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there. In terms of um, the methods, so it, this was discussed about, and I'd just like to bring a couple of points here. So in this cohort that was identified, they recognized that 74% of the patients in this, what we may be a potentially higher risk cohort, uh, were theoretically suitable for lobectomy under the current guidelines. So 75% eligible for hemithyroidectomy is, um, it, it, at least in our practices and in maybe some of the uh, literature out there, is a little bit high for uh, how many patients should be offering hemithyroidectomy uh, to. Uh, if you compare with a couple other papers, there is, and I'd like to, and I get to spend a couple slides on this um, topic, is contralateral thyroid nodules. So um, again, the article from Sloan, uh, increased detection of contralateral nodules uh, over their time frame of this study when it was uh, published, they found that actually 75% of their patients towards the end of that study because of contralateral nodules ended up undergoing total thyroidectomy. Um, and uh, Ritter, uh, another population, they showed a relatively high incidence of contralateral thyroid nodules as well. Just as a background from our zone um, in Alberta, so you'll see what, uh, so this is the data collected from our database um, that uh, are roughly around 20% of patients uh, were actually treated with lobectomy for thyroid cancer as opposed to about, um, you know, roughly 75 to 80% who had total thyroidectomy. So with that, just a little talk about contralateral thyroid nodules. So the management may be a little bit controversial. If you look at the ATA 2015 guidelines in the supporting text, they actually recommend doing a total thyroidectomy for any nodule that's greater than five millimeters um, based on this, one of their supporting literature papers. Um, so there's, uh, so that, uh, then to move on a little bit more about contralateral thyroid nodules. So back to the paper that we're discussing today, uh, and this was shown earlier, the ineligibility criteria. So this was the when they had the initial about 1,000 patients, and they said that 250 were ineligible for lobectomy. The criteria listed um, in the paper were size greater than four centimeters, suspicious lymph nodes, extrathyroidal extension. That's 
pretty much straight from recommendation 35B of the American Thyroid Association. And then they also mentioned atypical confidential thyroid nodules on ultrasound, history of radiation therapy and family history of thyroid cancer as other things. From the text of the article, though, uh, looking through that, when you look at those 250 patients, it appears that there's no record of any patients being excluded uh, from um, lobectomy as a result of having a contralateral thyroid nodule, and there's no real definition of atypical contralateral thyroid nodules. So, in terms of those ineligibility criteria listed in the paper, uh, it, it includes some of the ATA guidelines, but I would suggest maybe not all of them. So it certainly includes all the ones that are strictly listed in Recommendation 35B. So you have the pocket guide to ATA guidelines around this. It would certainly have those. It includes a couple of items from the supporting text around that, um, but not all of them. So didn't include age greater than 45 and did not include all contralateral thyroid nodules, which is what's listed in uh, the supporting text from the ATA, just the atypical nodules. Uh, nodules. And if you um, look at the text, as I said, and I, uh, this would be great if we get some clarity on this, it doesn't seem that any patients were actually excluded from lobectomy in this model by having a contralateral thyroid nodule. So getting to uh, this, um, uh, figure that or table that we've uh, already looked at this this I think is great um, so I think this actually does explain some of the discrepancy between suggested eligibility in this paper for lobectomy and maybe some other centers experience so uh, this in the paper here that's uh, listed as the ATA criteria I think that has some but not necessarily all of the ATA criteria I think criteria two that uh, was just mentioned as being sort of what's more closely followed in, the, in that zone in terms of uh, how they actually select patients for lobectomy is probably actually a little bit closer to the actual ATA um, guidelines. And that does bring the number of patients eligible uh, down to about 25%, which is maybe more consistent with uh, some other publications and centers experience. So just around that, uh, and this is my final slide about the sort of the, the classic journal club review. Um, really critique aside, I think this was really an excellent paper. It was well done. It's great that it's come from a, a prospectively collected database. That's wonderful. And I think as uh, Dr. Pasaika mentioned, what a key feature is, is that even if you change the selection criteria for lobectomy, there's still a significant portion of patients that are either going to require intraoperative conversion, um, which I'll say is actually quite rare at our center, or completion thyroidectomy. So with that, I'll segue to a little bit of discussion around that. Um, so kind of using a bit of a logical process here. So if we agree that using a strict application of 2015 ATA criteria for lobectomy, we could probably offer lobectomy for thyroid cancer to about maybe a quarter of our patients as surgeons coming through or, or uh, other specialties. Um, and of that 25%, if we agree that about 50% are going to likely require a conversion to a total thyroidectomy, either interoperatively, postoperatively, um, then really should we be routinely offering this option to all of our patients? So there's the question I'd like to, to pose. We touched on this briefly earlier, so I described this as the good old days in thyroid surgery, 2009 ATA guidelines. Uh, we, in this image here, we've got a happy patient, we've got a happy physician. Uh, Decisions are quite easy, easy at this point. So patient came in, you had a greater than one centimeter thyroid cancer, you're gonna get a total thyroidectomy. There might be some question about uh, the extent of, first of all, would you do a central compartment neck dissection? And if so, the extent of that. And those are really the controversies at the time. And then 2015 ATA guidelines came up. I was uh, fortunate to have a bit of an early preview of these. Um, uh, I was asked to review them and endorse them for the Canadian Society of Laryngology Head and Neck Surgery uh, uh, for when this paper came out. And when we looked through them and started doing the review process, this is the one that really leapt out as surgeons, was Recommendation 35B. And as we've gone through before, so this really uh, changed. Um, and just to go through it, so basically the, what they're saying is greater than one, less than four centimeter without risk features. 
that now the statement was that instead of what used to be total thyroidectomy is that the initial surgical procedure could be either a bilateral procedure or a unilateral procedure. Thyroid lobectomy alone may be sufficient initial treatment for lowers papillary and follicular carcinomas. So that was a significant change. I think the way that was put out in the language around that is a, a lot of people I think interpreted that as well, you could do either procedure, but you're saying that it's sufficient treatment to do a lobectomy, so we should probably be steering towards lobectomy. And I think a lot of people, including myself, uh, started changing their practice as a result of that. I will say in, that it's a bit of an incomplete recommendation in terms of how it's phrased in that specific recommendation line. So if you go back into the um, the supporting text around this, it does fail to include the suggestions in that supporting text, which is you should really be looking quite seriously at patients over 45, comfortable health, thyroid nodules, radiation therapy, and family history in making that decision to provide lobectomy. So again, if you have the pocket cards on this, if it's on your app on your phone, it only has the recommendations, it doesn't include that information. And I will say the one thing about this recommendation that's when it came out is it does really has increased the complexity of decision making and also patient counseling that's required. If you again go back to those ATA guidelines and look in the in the fine text around that, well, it's interesting. So survival rates, they conclude, and I would agree with this, that the extent of initial thyroid surgery probably doesn't have a great deal of impact on disease-specific survival in this type of cancer. But if you want to get the lowest recurrence rates, there's probably is actually a benefit to total thyroidectomy in those circumstances. And again, controversial, but the, I would suggest that the bulk of the evidence does lean towards that way. So the question then becomes, well, if total thyroidectomy offers an equivalent cure and a lower chance of recurrence, why would we even offer a lobectomy? Well, of course, there's pros and cons to both of these surgeries. So total thyroid is a single procedure, provides an excellent cure rate, maybe less recurrence, there is the requirement for thyroid hormone after the surgery. It may be uh, increased morbidity in some regard, uh, and then quality of life is a question as well. Whereas if you look at lobectomy, uh, as we said, there's a significant chance there might require a second surgery. It does provide excellent cure rates. Um, there probably is a little increase in recurrence rates, and I think that is really important from a patient perspective. The no thyroid hormone, I think, is uh, something we need to talk about. I've got a slide on that in a second. Lower morbidity and quality of life. So we'll talk about those last three items just a little bit more here. So thyroid replacement after lobectomy. So I think of when these guidelines first came out, um, there was discussions in offices with patients that, you know, if we do a th lobectomy, there's a reasonable chance that you won't need thyroid hormone replacement. In fact, I think as people got more experienced with this, they realized that probably wasn't that true. Uh, this is a nice paper that uh, came out from um, MUSC group uh, fairly recently and looked at this question. So they concluded that if you actually strictly follow those 2015 ATA guidelines with the requirement to keep your TSH suppressed, for, well, I shouldn't say suppressed, but you want your TSH at 0.5 to 2, that actually about three quarters of your patients are going to end up being on thyroid replacement um, after the surgery. So those um, ATA requirements, I think, are um, a little under, uh, under question. Dr. Pesai can probably comment this. I know there's a number of endocrinologists in Calgary because I sometimes send patients up there for second opinions or down there uh, who don't necessarily feel that we should actually be um, doing that thyroid uh, suppression that aggressively, that the evidence around that isn't strong. So it's kind of practice dependent, but again, strictly following ATA guidelines, a lot of patients will require thyroid hormone. Morbidity, so total thyroid, I, I think it's reasonable to say that there's this increased risk of a number of complications. So the biggest one will be hypocalcemia. So obviously if you're doing a lobectomy, the likelihood of hypocalcemia is nil essentially, um, and slightly higher increased risk of these other complications as well. But again, these are all rare events. It's related to surgeon training experience. Uh, this graph here is um, from, I think this is uh, Greg Randolph's work uh, where they looked at uh, surgical volume, likelihood of complications, and also the procedure, just to give you a flavor for what we're looking at. And that would be all complications. And then quality of life. So this is, I think a really key here. So we've talked a lot about the theoretical aspects of benefits and, and, and real aspects of uh, you know benefits that 
reduce morbidity, other issues related to lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. But in the long run, the patient's quality of life is probably going to be the most important differentiating factor. So this is a group out of uh, uh, University of Toronto uh, who very recently put this paper out. It's one of the few articles that's actually looked at this question of, you know, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy, long-term quality of life. And it's quite interesting what they found. So the long-term quality of life between these two groups was really not significantly different, whether you treat it with hemi or total. But in the secondary analysis, um, the worry about the recurrence appeared to be higher in individuals was treated with hemithyroidectomy. And so at least anecdotally in my experience, um, that I've noticed that as a challenge as well for patients is that if you do a kind of partial surgery at the start, um, there's always, or in, in many patients, there's this a bit of concern about uh, that remaining thyroid lobe. So the question that I posed at the beginning of this very brief discussion, uh, should we be offering lobectomy for most low-risk thyroid cancers? And I think I've come to a stunning conclusion, which is I don't know if there is a right answer to that right now. From my perspective, I will say, and it was reflected a little bit in that uh, local data that I presented earlier in the talk. Um, so when these guidelines came out in 2015, I think there was a shift amongst uh, quite a few surgeons um, to maybe be more aggressive about offering lobectomy, going through those kind of long conversations with patients. Uh, but I will say more recently, and I've discussed this with our surgical group as well, is that based on the relatively high completion rates, the requirement for Synthroid afterwards, we've kind of maybe backed away from that a little bit. It's still part of the discussion, um, but I would say that we've gone back to offering, or after discussion, uh, uh, the patients will uh, pick with us supporting that to go with the total thyroidectomy route. So I think it's maybe the pendulum swinging back a little bit. So again, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate the, off the uh, offer to come speak with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, Dr. Basika, for these uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations with, with practical implications, really, um, be it from a surgical standpoint or from any of these patients, that are, any of our, our colleagues who are going to be preoperatively Cons uh, counseling these patients. One of the questions that came up on the chat was, do you have any ideas as to, both of you, uh, we'll start with Dr. Pasika, any ideas about how we can improve our preoperative uh, patient selection, how we think patients, in a, you know, patients that might need, need a front, upfront total thyroidectomy, thinking about what do you think a um, very uh, specialized ultrasound for everybody would help do you think molecular molecular analysis now or in the future or the near future might help dr pasika do you have an idea of how we can do this better to to decrease the yes. the number of completion thyroidectomies right i mean that is uh uh something that uh, we all grapple with and i think what it uh First of all, it is important that all patients undergo a ultrasound, whether that's surgeon directed, whether you have a, a dedicated uh, thyroid uh, ultrastenographer, however that's done, but proper lymph node mapping and an assessment of the risk of these lesions, uh, looking at the contralateral side, making sure that there isn't any suggestion of extrathyroidal extension. And it, it really does have to be done by somebody that's really focused on trying to get those points for us. So definitely um, the preoperative ultrasound. I think um, molecular testing, this will be interesting as we can move molecular testing into the fine needle aspiration. If we, can we identify the higher risk of um, lesions um, uh, based on molecular testing. Uh, certainly we don't have that here yet um, in the sense of being 100% uh, predictive, but I think that the future is there. Um, the central compartment's hard to assess preoperatively for occult lymph nodes, so that the surgeon is still going to be one of the major factors there. And 
you know, I, I teach and I think it's important that as a surgeon, it is important for you to diligently look and assess that central compartment and assess the nodule and whether it's invading um, in the operating room and be prepared to uh, do a total thyroidectomy. But I agree with Dr. Harris, um, I've lost an appetite to, um, to spend, uh, to uh, do lobectomies um, up front just based on, I think you may be low risk. There's a long, much longer discussion and a lot of patients do um, have either nodes, um, nodules on the other side uh, or they're just so anxious about cancer, it really would be um, better to just eliminate the need for a second operation. But um, we're not there yet, as the I think the data is showing. Dr. Harris, do you have a comment on that? How can we do better? Do more total thyroidectomies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then you don't have to worry about the selection. Uh, that's a lit glib, but I, I do think... Yeah, it's a very challenging problem. I, I think this paper very nicely showed that even if you're changing your preoperative risk and selection criteria, you're still going to have relatively high rates of completion. Um, I will say that in my practice, it, it would be very rare to do an interoperative conversion to a total thyroidectomy, um, and that may be just a, a bit of our practice pattern around that. And I would like to comment just a little bit on the lymph node status. Um, so interoperative assessment of lymph nodes is a differentiating factor for making those decisions. So uh, there's been a bit of work around this about, and there's one paper in particular that compared um, preoperative ultrasound assessment, interoperative ultrasound assessment, uh, interoperative clinical assessment, and to see what the accuracy rates there were. The truth is it's, uh, at least according to that data, and that would be my experience as well, that I think surgeons are, we're very good at picking up sort of gross involvement of the lymph nodes. We're terrible, and the evidence supports this, at picking up microscopic involvement, which is by far the most common disease presentation for thyroid cancers. So I, uh, I, I worry about the recommendation of relying so much on interoperative clinical assessment of lymph node status in terms of um, lymph node assessment uh, in, in um, sort of assessing, as uh, using that as a primary feature for doing your uh, conversion to a completion thyroidectomy. And it sounds like you're doing, um, which I think is going to be some uh, excellent work, is um, looking at really doing some robust studies about the role of uh, still prophylactic or, or elective uh, central compartment neck dissections in these patients. Well, I had also had a question. I get the impression, though, that even small micrometastases, you, you talked about it, Dr. Pasika, that micrometastases, finding them in the prophylactic neck dissection, did alter your, um, your you, you would actually would have probably completed these patients more. Uh, can you give your thoughts about doing like a lobectomy and a unilateral prophylactic neck dissection? Do that sort of become in style? Do you think that would be a way of maybe staging patients or maybe just, you know, removing prophylactically some of these nodes, would it reduce local regional recurrence? Do you have a thought about doing half and half? Yeah, I, I think, um, so uh, yeah, there are groups that are sort of doing that. Um, I think uh, what we're, t um, here, uh, the prophylactic central lymph node dissection, the pendulum went, we, we were doing them, uh, you know, as a, in all patients with uh, papillary thyroid cancer, we were get, seeing a slightly higher incidence of hypocalcemia and maybe permanent hypoparathyroidism. And so the, the pendulum started to swing back a, a bit. Um, and we're not as aggressive in everybody getting a prophylactic central lymph node dissection. So unlike some centers that continue to do that and are getting that information, I would say most of us, uh, at least in Southern Alberta, are not doing, um, are selectively doing prophylactic central lymph node dissections. The okay. lymph nodes that we're seeing uh, that converted, these were clinically positive. So these are not, we're not, asking the surgeons to take out uh, uh, lymph nodes and send them up for frozen section and convert. What, when we talked about that they found positive nodes, 
they were clinically positive, just not picked up on preoperative ultrasound. Because Jeff's right, we're not very good at picking up microscopic disease. And this data supported that because 50% of the time it was microscopic disease, not clinically positive disease um, in our lymph nodes with our prophylactic central lymph node dissection. So um, I don't like the idea of a lobectomy and a prophylactic central lymph node dissection. So you get four out of five out of six positive lymph nodes on a 3.9 centimeter tumor. Um, are you really going to call that patient intermediate risk and stop there? Um, yeah. yeah. It's a tough call. It maybe complicates it, things even more. It does, it does complicate. Thank you so much. Yeah. We're running out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasika, Dr. Harris, for these thought-provoking presentations and the discussion. I want to thank Lilly Oncology also for sponsoring this presentation. Um, thank the Thank Foundation and um, everybody who's made this happen. Um, thank we you. Gotta, we're going to have to sign off now. Everybody take care okay. and hope to see you again soon on the platform. Wonderful. Happy Thanks holidays. again.